Hi, I'm Carlos, uh, and today I'm going to teach you about tensors. Um, just a little small disclaimer first, uh, please pay attention to this presentation because this one I don't think you'll be able to like literally search on the internet. Uh, this one is mostly about understanding the concept rather than like formulas and math. So I, I swear I, I'll make my best to make you understand this concept but it will be very difficult if you try to like later on try to google it or something because it's pretty complex and it's more about understanding the concept rather than like a lot of math so i promise like you won't be bored okay so after that disclaimer let me talk to you about tensors so we all know calc right and we're pretty good at it i mean we're in calc bc so like it's good that we have a calculus definition for a tensor so in calculus a tensor can be described as partial derivatives and gradients that transform the Jacobian matrix. Okay, class is over. Any questions? Nothing? Okay. Nah, 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 nah. Okay, okay, okay. Let me try again, okay? So we all know linear algebra, right? And we're, I mean, pretty good at it, somewhat good at it, let's say. So using linear algebra, a tensor can be described as the collection of vectors and covectors combined together using the tensor product. Now is class over, Mr. Zamora? Okay, okay. Jokes aside, tensors can be described, manipulated, and used in many fields in math, and can be represented in many different ways. This can mostly be described using an analogy. At first, we all started learning math and it was just PEMDAS, which can only be represented in few ways. Later, we learned algebra, which can be represented by formulas, graphs, vectors, matrices, and can be manipulated in many multiple ways. In linear algebra, we then learned about this new world that can be represented in even more ways, such as matrices, formulas, graphs, products, vector spaces, and probably many that we don't even know. Well, tensors is the next level. It is what goes after linear algebra and something, something that can be represented and used as many different things as, and it can be manipulated in many different ways. So in the lecture, I will really give two definitions to tensors, two which are the easiest and most close to our knowledge at hand. The first definition, and pay attention, is that tensors are a multidimensional array of numbers. Now, don't get scared. This is pretty simple, and I will explain. So an array of one dimension is just a scalar, aka just a number. Some that have coded before may be familiar with this definition. After that, a two-dimensional array of numbers is just a vector, just any vector, or to visualize it as in linear algebra, it's an n by one matrix, while a scalar is a one times one matrix. After this, I think you can guess that a three-dimensional array is any n times m matrix. Going back to the definition, a tensor is a multidimensional array of numbers, so that a scalar is just a tensor of dimension 0, and a vector is a tensor of dimension 1, and m times m matrix is a tensor of dimension 2, and so on. Now, you may ask, what does a tensor of dimension 3 look like? Well, it looks like a cube. And if you're asking why, let me explain. If I have a scalar which is a tensor of dimension 0, I can add another dimension by, let's say, stretching it to the right. And this makes it a vector, which is a tensor of dimension 1. If we stretch it again, but now downwards, this will become a matrix, which is a tensor of dimension 2. So if we follow the same logic, we can stretch it along the z-axis and make this a cube, one which is comprised of multiple matrices placed one after the other. This would be a tensor of dimension 3. Now, I hope this is simple and that you're still paying attention. So now that we kind of know what a tensor is, I will show you some other definitions that are mostly ways to describe tensors. Let's start by rank. In linear algebra, the rank is the dimension of the range. Now, don't worry, we're not getting into this, but this will help you remember because rank is a dimension. So in tensors, rank will literally be the dimension of the tensor. So for example, a scalar is a tensor of rank zero. A vector is a tensor of rank 1, a matrix is a tensor of rank 2, and so on. Now let me explain what an axis is. An axis is a specific dimension of a tensor. So in a matrix, an axis can be the rows or an axis can be the columns. And that matrix has two axes, 
because it has two dimensions. This not only helps us to refer specifically to an axis, but it also can be used to describe things such as the length of the axis, which is just that, the length. For example, a 4x3 matrix has two axes, and the length of the row axis is 3. Can you guess the length of the column axis? The last term that we will learn is shape. So the shape is the length of each axis in the tensor. So in the previous example, an axis had length of 4, and the other axis had a length of 3. And this is because it was a 4 by 3 matrix. So the shape can be thought of as the size of what you're drawing. If you think of a matrix as a square, the shape of a matrix can be 4,5, which would be a square 4 units wide and 5 units long. And if you have a cube, which can be seen as a rank 3 tensor, then the shape can be 3,3,3, which would be a Rubik's cube. So to recap, a tensor is a multidimensional array of numbers, aka many numbers put together in different dimensions and they can be zero dimensions, one dimension, two dimensions, or any nth dimension. Mr. Samara, please don't ask what a, a thousand rank tensor looks like, thank you. And then, the rank is just the same as the dimension, the axis is a specific dimension that can be worked with, the length of the axis is how long the axis is, and the shape of the lengths of all the axes combined. Whoa, I think that was pretty simple, right? Well, remember I told you that I would give you two definitions? Well, that's because the previous definition is flawed, and it's not correct. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, any tensor can be shown and represented as a matrix, scalar, vector, or whatever the cube thingy was. The problem is that not every vector, matrix, or cube thingy will be a tensor. In other words, a tensor is to matrices what a square is to rectangles. All tensors are matrices, just as all squares are rectangles. But not all rectangles are squares. Just as, not, just as not every matrix is a tensor. This is because tensors have order, certain rules, and behaviors that not any matrix can have. Matrices, vectors, and cubes can just be random numbers put together. But tensors have order and meaning to each number that is placed inside. So let's go to the second definition of a tensor, one that I promise is correct. So a tensor is an object that is invariant under a change of coordinates and has its components that change in a special predictable way under a change of coordinates. Now let's break this down. When we say object, we are referring to the tensor itself, that the tensor is an object with these properties. Now let's do an exercise to understand the rest of the definition. Grab a pencil, water bottle, or whatever looks like a vector and point it at the projector. Let's say that this is your pencil, and let's draw some x, y, and z coordinates in our plane. Now, this pencil, which we said was a vector, can be broken apart into x, y, and z components, and we can describe the pencil as 3x's, 3y's, and 2z's, when x, y, and z are our coordinates. But what if we chose different coordinates? Let's call this totally random coordinates a, b, and c. These coordinates are as valid as x, y, and z, only, the only difference is that x, y, and z are the conventional. Now let's describe our vector with the new a, b, and c coordinates. So now we have 6 a's, 4 b's, and 1 c. Let's remember what we just did. We chose a vector, we used some coordinates to describe it. Then we changed the coordinates, and we described it again, but with different coordinates while the vector remained exactly the same, with the same magnitude and direction. Going back to the definition, a tensor is an object, which in this case is a pencil, that is invariant under a change of coordinates, meaning that the object will not change when the coordinates change, and has components that change in a special predictable way under a change of coordinates, meaning that when the coordinates were changed, the components used to describe the pencil also changed. Let's watch this animation, which is another example of how a vector can be described in multiple ways. Initially, we have the normal x, y, and z coordinates, and we can describe this vector using the x, y, and z coordinates. Then, 
if we change our coordinates, which would be, could be called a, b, and c, or whatever you want to call them, we could have the same vector, but described differently with the new coordinates. As you can see, the vector did not change, but as the coordinates changed, the components used to describe this vector did change meaning that the object was invariant, but the components did change in a special predictable way. So now you may think, what does a special and predictable way mean? Like, what, what does that mean? So first of all, let's write this again. We have three, uh, that we have that one pencil here equals 3y plus 3x plus 2z. And on the other one, we have that pencil equals 6y, I mean 6a, plus 4b's and 1c. Okay, so if we know how we change from these coordinates to these other coordinates, we can predict how we change from this definition of the pencil to this definition of the pencil. So going from one coordinate to the other, which means going from one definition to the other, can be called a forward transformation. And going back from the other coordinate back to the initial one, or to the second definition back to the first one, is called a backwards transformation. Now, what are we trying to do? So the definition says that a tensor is an object that, ha that is invariant under a change of coordinates and has components that change in a special predictable way under a change of coordinates. So if we change the coordinates, we should be able to predict the new components that make up for these coordinates, right? Now, because this is actually a math class, I will have to teach you some formulas and math and not just concepts, okay? So bear with me, but I will show you how we can do the forwards and backwards transformation. Okay, so in this context, instead of calling them the old coordinates and the new coordinates, we will call them the old basis and the new basis, okay? So the old basis is going to to be a two-dimensional, well, they are both going to be two-dimensional, and the old basis we're going to call it, let's say, x and y, and in the new basis we're going to call them x star and y star, okay? So, the new basis is going to be a y and an x. They're both going to be worth four little squares and they are going to be, let's say, like the normal. They are perpendicular to each other. Now, the X star and the Y star, we're going to change them a little bit. Now, let's say X star is going to be like this and the Y star is going to be like this. Okay? Now, these are two different coordinates and we need to know how to do this forwards transformation in order to later on be able to also change from let's say different types of objects in the coordinates, okay? Okay, so now we have to write the new basis in terms of the old basis, okay? So let's say x star is equal to we could say that it is equal to kind of half of x plus half of y right so we would have we would have half of x plus half of y now let's do the same for y star okay it's going to be some x's plus some y's right now y is going to have about one quarter of x, but you have to take in con into consideration that it is negative, right? So we have to put negative one fourth of x 
and the same with y, but with y it's four squares. So y goes down, y star goes down four squares, y goes down four squares. So this is just going to be negative one, okay? Now, we, with, with these equations that we have right now, we can create a, a matrix. This matrix is going to be called F because this is a forward transformation. And F is equal to, we will place one half and one half here, and then negative one fourth and negative one over here. This is called, well, this is the matrix for the forward transformation. Now let's do the same thing for the backwards transformation. Backwards transformation would be going back to the old basis, right? So let's do this right here. So for the backwards transformation, we have to do the same thing, but now we're going to write everything. We're going to write x in terms of x star and y star, okay? So x in terms, in terms of x star. Okay, now in order to find x and y in terms of x star and y star, I already did it, so because it was pretty difficult, but I will show you what I did, okay? So, this right here is x, okay? This is the length and how x is pointing, right? Over here, this is our x, okay? Now, we have to find the components of x prime and y prime, which add up to x, okay? Now, I did it already, but in this case, it would be one, two, and this is about one third of x prime of, of f, x star would have to be added, and then one and one third of y prime would have would have to be added. Okay, so here we have one, two, and two thirds, which is two and two thirds, and one and one third, one and one third of y star. So this is basically just adding the components needed to make this x, uh, x let's say, vector, but it's really the, well, it's, it's the basis, okay? Now the same for y. Uh, we have, this is y, right? This right here is y, okay? It's the y we were using. And we have to write y in terms of x star and y star, okay? So it takes a little bit of imagination, but you will have one x going one x star going down, and these um, then you would have these y star going up. Okay. So now, well, this x x star is going down, but what we had here it's it's going up, right? So what we have to do is to put it negative. So we have one and two thirds of x star is what we have, but we have it negative, right? Because it's going down. Now this y, uh, y star is going up, right? And we have about one third and plus one, right? So we would have here one third plus one but this would be all negative again, okay? And this is how we find, well, the components. It will take some time, some imagination, maybe some practice, but uh, it's the same thing as we did here in the previous one. It's just that when you use random bases, it's gonna be more abstract and more difficult to find them, right? Uh, and well, again, the, ba the backwards matrix will be the first equation goes as the first column and the second equation goes as the second column, okay? Perfect. Now, uh, we'll ignore a little bit the matrices for a little while, and we will try to see how we use these equations in order to, well, find, like, our initial goal, right? That it's predict the final outcome and how to change when you're changing coordinates, okay? So I'm, I'll show you this right now. Okay, so now let's try to uh, learn this by using an example, okay? So let's say that 
in the old bases, which is like kind of the normal coordinates we use, we have a tensor that is 4x long and let's say 6y long, okay? So this tensor, let's say it's a pencil, okay? We have a pencil that is 4x long and 6y long, okay? So if you remember, x was 4 like this, y was 4 like this. So we literally have something that would be 4x's and, well, 6y's. I don't know why I did it so big, but it's okay. You know what, let's say it's 5y, so it's not that big, okay? 5y's. So we would have something like this. So it's going to be a line with this vectors, okay. This is the line that we have, okay? Now, using what we already have, well, logic kind of tells you like, if you want to find y star, yeah, x star, you just have to plug in x and y. And honestly, in this case, logic is exactly what you should do. This is now, it's not really tricky, it's pretty simple. So if we want to find um, x star, we would have to plug in here. It's going to be 1 half times 4 plus 1 half times 5, right? Uh, because these are the components we already have. I mean, we don't really have units, but if x was 1 meter, we would just have 4 meters, right? And then we would just plug in here 4 meters, right? So I'll just leave this without any numbers. And so this would be the number for x star. And for y star, it would be negative 1 fourth times 4 plus negative 5. And well, it's that simple. And so going back to the definition of a tensor, a tensor is an object that is invariant under a change of coordinates. We just made uh, a vector that did not change when the, when, when the, when the coordinates changed. And then it has components that change in a special and predictable way, which is very important that it's predictable, under a change of coordinates. So when we change the coordinates, we change this. So you could say that this vector right here is a tensor, okay? Now, this is kind of the end of the lecture, but to do something a little bit extra, um, I will show you why f times b, which is something that makes sense, but f times b, like what do you think this would, what happens if I multiply these two matrices, right? Because, I mean, one does one thing and one kind of reverses it, right? So what does your intuition tell you? Well, the answer to the question is that the forwards matrix multiplied by the backwards matrix will give the identity matrix. Well, this is, well, and what this means is that really the backwards matrix is equal to the forwards matrix to the inverse of the forwards matrix, right? So, I mean, it's pretty interesting because most of like, it makes sense, but it's something that maybe you would not think, um, well, thinking about all these complicated numbers. So, yep, that's, that's the math part about it. Now I'll explain a little bit about the history of how this came to be and some of the applications for this type of mathematics. Okay, so as tensors are such a broad topic that encompasses things such as matrices, vectors, and even scalars, they are used in multiple instances. Many scientific theories and formulas use tensors in order to describe the world. This is because tensors are widely used in geometry as they can, as they can have infinitely many dimensions and behave a certain way. 
One very important application for these tensors has been Einstein's field equations, which are used to calculate the space-time geometry in the universe, something that is simply impossible to do describing using regular geometry. In fact, his equation uses a total of four tensors, and for this reason, what seems like one equation is in fact 16 equations. Other uses are to explain quantum states of particles, something that someday will be needed in order to make functioning quantum computers. And lastly, I'm just going to read basically off Wikipedia page because it's, it's so complex that I won't even try to explain it. But it's also used for continuum mechanics, permittivity, electric su susceptibility, and many other scientific equations and theories. In the history side, tensor analysis started with a mathematician called Carl Friedrich Gauss, Gauss, which is also the co-author of the Gauss Jordan, when he was working in differential geometry. Tensor calculus was de later developed by Giorgio Ricci Curbastro in 1890 and published and he published it under the name of absolute differential calculus. The concept was not fully recognized and well known until a man decided to tell us that space and time was the same thing and that we don't fall but rather we go in straight lines and the, sta and the space curves around us. The guy was called Albert Einstein and he was the person who made tensors widely known as he decided to write his formulas using tensors. In fact, he wasn't so fluid in the area and he had to ask a geometer called Marcel Grossman to teach him. Levi Civita later created a campaign to proofread and correct all of Einstein's work, thing that lasted two years. To end, I want to quote Einstein, as he once said, I admire the elegance of your method of computation. It must be nice to ride through these fields upon the horse of true mathematics, while the like of us have to make our way laboriously on foot. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed as much as possible. And I hope that you understood, uh, like, I mean, everything that I explained. Uh, I tried to ch choose the two methods that I think were easier to explain. But as I said, this is such a wide topic that it can be explained by many different ways and in different many like methods. Uh, but like, I mean, I hope you enjoyed. And the last thing I wanted to say is that we are barely touching the tip of the iceberg with this topic. Uh, I said like a really big topic again. So like if you want to know more about it, uh, I don't know, probably maybe Nico, if you're watching, you probably want to know more. Uh, even Mr. Zamora. Um, so yeah, like feel free to, to research a little bit more about this. Uh, it's pretty interesting how they use this method to like describe geometry and it's kind of like a whole different thing. So yeah, thank you. Bye.